Colin, good evening. Well, t- welcome. Hi, Mark. You well? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Another big news day today with Michael Wood. <laughs> I mean, you sit down to prep a bunch of things. What, what shall I talk to Mark about tonight? Inevitably, you know, there's so much politics around. We'll, be, we'll have political stuff, and we will. Um, but, yeah, boy, oh, boy. Uh, it's another. It's a kind of extraordinary. Uh, Jenna Lynch, the political editor at TV3, was working uh, overtime on, on her stuff tonight, saying it's appeared that uh, Hipkins, she said he's, it's as if he's on a sick carnival ride fronting up about another minister. Bread and butter is toast, she said, sort of working those yes. metaphors. Um, just I guess she means having lost three cabinet ministers uh, in three months. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's kind of reeling from that. Elliot, my colleague in the studio here, says he's disappointed that none of the media had come up with um, Michael Wood's actions splintering the cabinet. <laughs> Yes, a thorn in the side. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. Oh, you've, oh, you've gone one better. Okay, that ups the ante. <laughs> oh, but no, I mean, but of course, it's a you know, it is a serious issue. Yeah, Three good. cabinet ministers, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Stuart Nash, Mecca Fightery Before that, just mm. seems like so long ago, and it really wasn't. Um, Ming Foon, in a, in yeah, all that, not, not a member of the government, of course. Yeah. But oh yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. Uh, although she's not out of no. a job, but um, yeah, goodness me, lots, lots, and lots, and lots of it. Now, after the scenes in Oporteki sparked by the mongrel mob Tangi. Uh, they were widely aired in the media and the National Party then of course released a new policy on gangs. This was just Sunday wasn't it? Seems like an age ago. <laughs> it does. Uh, it certainly got the media attention. Yeah and that timing was not a coincidence was it? Uh, so for example um, their success in uh, playing this to the media I guess uh, that policy announcement was the lead story on TVNZ's One News on Sunday and they introduced it this way. Tonight on One News, Christopher Luxon announces a new policy to keep gang members locked up longer. If you choose to align yourself with a gang and engage in criminal activity, you will face more severe consequences. Our national plans to tweak prison time amid fears that will just increase harm rather than reduce it. Well, so they'd be delighted, I guess, to have got that coverage for their new policy. Yeah, I think so. All those hundreds of thousands of people sitting down in front of the 6pm news. And I think we will see a lot more of this, Mark, as we get closer to the election. Parties are going to release political policies and ideas um, in what used to be a bit of a dead zone of a Sunday morning. They can get them discussed, possibly even on those Sunday uh, those weekend politics shows, but certainly in the in the evening news, with the expectation, you know, the media will will, will grab hold of them. So, TVNZ's intro, I've got a, an issue with there because where they describe it as a new policy that will keep gang members locked up for longer. Um, I mean, I know you have to paraphrase, of course, uh, for the purposes of a bulletin intro, but I don't think that was a good summary because it's really just a tweak uh, that obliges judges to factor in. Uh, gang membership when they're sentencing somebody after a conviction and even if they do it doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome's going to be you know quotes locking them up for longer Uh, and also it was really just an add-on to existing anti-gang measures that that same party had already announced Um, but yes of course it wasn't just um, TVNZ that grabbed hold of that on a relatively slow Sunday and reported it pretty much that same way. One News did say that they'd also address whether the policy would do more harm than good. Did they actually explore that? Yes, I mean, in the relatively brief uh, 6 p.m. length news report, they did. And also, um, TVNZ's political editor, Jessica Much Mackay, came on at the end of that lead story. And she did point out judges can already, in fact, if they want to use gang membership as an aggravating factor uh, without this kind of direction. Um, But she was also, I think, when she uh, was doing her two-way at the end, pretty well aware that this announcement was made with the media in mind. National are being opportunistic here. They're trying to strike while the iron's hot. And politically, that definitely makes sense. But when you dig into this policy, it's really only changing a word or two in the law. And it is an option that is already available to the judiciary at the moment. What this policy announcement does do, though, is allow National to yet again talk about the government being soft on crime. We heard Christopher Luxon say that message several times today and he'll be hoping that some of that is getting cut through. National is also arguing that this is just a small part of a wider sentencing policy that will be announced soon. Yeah, so I think there, that was a pretty good interpretation of what was going on, the political reality and the context of that announcement. But all that kind of makes me wonder, if, if if they know this, like why did TVNZ lead with this effectively tiny tweak to a policy? You know, as she said, there's a comprehensive justice 
or sentencing policy to come. They've also announced other anti-gang measures in the past, as she said, and we mentioned earlier. So it's as if they are kind of considering that the political strategy of releasing this, this way is actually the news and not the policy itself. And I, I think that's a bit the wrong way around. Mm. So gangs like the Mongrel Mob, they've been around a long time and so have events that uh, disrupt life in places where they congregate and as witnessed by, with the tangi. But did this prompt, a, uh, I guess, a wider debate about what works and what doesn't work for managing them? Yeah, yeah, there was some of that. And coincidentally, the Q&A show on TVNZ1 on the Sunday morning. Uh, th- this is before, going to be before that National Party announcement of that uh, that gang sentencing policy. Um, it focused on what happened in the Portiki, and the host of the show, Jack Tame, uh, talked to Warwick Godfrey, who's a former uh, Mongrel Bomb member, who's now a district councillor in Kawarau, uh, which is not too far away in, in the region. And he made the point, uh, Warwick Godfrey, that police and gangs work together to manage that whole thing around the tangi uh, pretty well. And um, Warwick Godfrey came to the conclusion that, in the end, the media didn't actually help much. Sadly, uh, some media uh, outlets or some people have taken an opportunity to to politicise the issue and not be respectful in the languaging is very unhelpful in those situations. Yeah, and I think it's interesting he says that because it seems to me he's seeing that political grandstanding and the media reporting it as kind of the same thing. And and in a sense, I don't blame him because you know when the when the the National Party is saying things directly, trying to piggyback on the publicity mm-hmm. of that event in Apodiki, uh Yeah, you can't. You certainly can't blame people for looking on and thinking that um, you know the the media and the politics are all part of the. Uh, the same matrix there mm. with, with reporting like we mentioned earlier. But the media do have to reflect what they saw at Apotiki and you could see that the, the gangs were playing up to the cameras what well, it felt like that watching the news and uh, you know it, it did cause genuine anxiety schools closed, that sort of thing. Oh sure and that yeah, that certainly isn't normal uh, for a whole week I think but so Jack Tame in the interview with Councillor Godfrey did challenge him on that he said look it's pretty obvious there's antisocial behaviour, very intimidating behaviour um, so you know they, they did discuss that, he, they weren't off the hook on that but I think it's Q&A called a portiki um, a town brought to a standstill by the tangi kind of playing into some of that as well um, but some of the on the ground reporting it was interesting uh, actually challenged that. So with all the noise going on around it and all those images that we saw on TV news, Stuff's Virginia Fallon was there. She quoted the town's mayor, who I think is a former policeman himself, as saying life was relatively normal, apart from those um, that school closure that you mentioned and the fact the road was closed around uh, the peak of the Tangi. Um, and he was very critical of the media and politicians claiming the town had been taken over. Um, well, that, that wasn't quite what Q&A said, but it was getting there. And Virginia Fallon in, in the story also had this interesting quote, uh, said one member, staff member at the local Foursquare uh, said, nobody would comment to stuff because, um, and these are their words, anything we say will be blown out of proportion. But she did offer me one quote, says Virginia Fallon, what I will say is that no one here has been fearing for their lives. It's ridiculous. So I thought it was interesting that someone working in a local shop was more afraid of um, you know, the media beating up what mm. she said rather than anything the gang might do about it. Um, but on those same comments about the mayor, Mike Hosking on ZB accused him of gaslighting New Zealanders by saying, you know, things were okay uh, in a Portuguese. That judgment he, I guess, formed from the comfort of his studio in central Auckland, <laughs> some distance away. Uh, Heather Duplessy Allen, a ZB colleague, uh, also used that Mad Max description that opposition politicians used to describe those scenes in a Portuguese. Um, again, that so politicians and media using the same language, um, uh, you know, I think in the minds of people does lead them to believe it's almost one and the same thing. But I, I, I was intrigued to read uh, Gordon Campbell. He writes thoughtful columns for scoop.co.nz and he said the sort of willingness on both opposition politicians and parts of the media to amp up the menace uh, reminded him of a Wes Anderson movie. <laughs> he said Anderson would have had a field day with such golden material, the banality of everyday routine underpinned by a yearning in some quarters for flame-lit extremities of criminal passion. <laughs> so quite, quite lyrical there, but I guess he means that there was a sort of willingness, uh, sort of an enjoyment of those um, those extreme scenes that, uh, the, mm. the, that they, the media had to play with. Well, one barometer of that, of course, is the old talk-back radio. Did it light up? 
Yeah, well, a bit, but actually, you know, by Monday, uh, they had the um, ethnicity and surgery waiting lists oh. issue running hot, and that's something, by the way, I'll take a good look at on uh, the Media Watch on, on the weekend, because that's sort of still unfolding the way that's been treated. But yeah, as you mentioned, we've had Michael Wood since then, yeah. even Chris Luxon and his Tesla, there's been plenty of other um, <laughs> topics. But what I did note was that on Sunday, the first sort of talkback opportunity uh, for that was the Weekend Collective show on News Talk ZB in the afternoon, which opens up with an hour on politics and current issues. And um, I was very impressed with the host, Tim Beveridge, because he he did a bit of homework before interviewing Nationals' Paul Goldsmith. So he looked at the Sentencing Act, for example, and then uh, put him on the spot, for example, about um, you know the Bill, of, the Bill of Rights Act. What advice have you got regarding the Bill of Rights? Oh, well, we haven't got any advice yet. I mean, that's part of the process yeah. that you, you'd go through in government. Um, and so, you know, we'd, we'd do that appropriately. But ultimately, a, a government has to decide, um, you know, how it balances public safety versus other rights. And, and you know, we're confident that uh, public safety on, on this score is more important. Yeah, so he's right there. Of course, when something goes through the legislative process, then that sort of thing would be factored in. But, you know, if I was a politician proposing a change to a law uh, in sentencing. You know, I think I'd, I'd want to have that uh, perhaps at my fingertips. But Tim Beveridge also went on to ask Paul Goldsmith um, an even more fundamental question. How do you actually prove uh, to a judge's satisfaction that someone uh, is in a gang? And so this to and fro between them goes on for almost a minute. So it's a bit of a long clip. But I think it's, um, it's a pretty interesting exchange. Have a listen. On the nuts and bolts side of things, um, how do you prove membership of a gang? Because it's not like they—it's not really like they keep a nice little file of paid-up Jews and subs, is it? Well, 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 yeah, but there's a there's a national gang register, yeah. uh, and there's eight thousand nine hundred people, I think, on it now. Um, they're recruiting faster than the police. Um, there's only just over ten thousand police, and you know the number of gang members on that register is is creeping up uh, yeah. all the time, and that's a big part of the problem. So uh, there's a register, and that that's how the courts have to sort of work their way through. I guess I mean, I'm not wanting to hone in too much on that, but I mean, I would imagine as a defence lawyer that you'd just chew through holes in that. It's like, well, fine, I'm on a, my client's on a list, but they're no longer a member of the gang. So is it a bit more problematic than that? Well, uh, defence lawyers always come up with all sorts of schemes. But, I mean, as a, as a legislative, obviously, that's going to be a, a design challenge for the, the, the law as we develop that in government, if we get a chance, yeah. uh, um, to make it as robust as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I like the way he did that. I think it reveals there was a little bit of uh, haste in forming that policy. And Interesting that the talkback calls that followed that actually picked up on what Tim Beveridge had highlighted there, and some of them were, you know, expressing a lot of doubts, where I was kind of expecting that, you know, having seen those images, people would be, um, you know, baying mm. for mm. Um, longer sentences, locking them up for longer, mm. as TVNZ said. Well, Tim does have a law background, so I guess, you know, he, he thinks that way as well. Knows, oh, does knows he? The territory. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Now, the government can drip feed policy details through uh, the the media as well. And on Monday, uh, the Prime Minister used his post-Cabinet press conference to to announce to reporters a new tweak to its child care policy. Yeah, and they got the lead story on News Hub at 6 on Monday, one day later, with their announcement. So, you know, that did sort of have me thinking, oh, maybe I can't criticise or shouldn't be cynical about the National Party or any opposition party that wants to try and do the same on a Sunday. Um, but reporters also picked up reporting this, that effectively this is another part of the recent budget that they've had to alter uh, the government after industry feedback that what they proposed in the budget wasn't going to work. And they had to do the same Uh, with uh, Auckland and Wellington, I think both the councils saying they couldn't implement the half-price public transport for under-25s by the 1st of July, which is also a a budget policy. So, yeah, it goes two ways, doesn't doesn't it? You use that forum, as the Prime Minister did, uh, to get the policy out there in in front of the media, but then you've got to answer the questions. And uh, I think News Hub's Jenna Lynch said uh, really what they've done is they've prioritised budget secrecy over workability because if they'd aired their ideas before announcing it in the budget, they would have found out that there would be opposition from within the industry uh, about the practicality and workability of it uh, that they could have addressed beforehand. So, uh, yeah, double-edged sword, I think, using <laughs> using the, the forum like that to announce policy in front of a room full of uh, political reporters. Mm. 
Now, in one sense, this is uh, politics as usual. We're talking election fever gripping the media, um, government and opposition drip-feeding policy snippets, uh, as we've seen, as we've talked about already, and criticising each other's initiatives. But with an election coming up, it's also a, a play for public support, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, and all this is ramping up. We're still some way from the election, but clearly it's happening now. Um, But with that in mind, I thought that watching those politics shows in the weekend, the News Hub Nation show uh, was interesting because usually they have a set piece interview with, uh, you know, a cabinet minister or a senior opposition politician. This time they went a bit broader and interviewed the leader of the top party, um, the, who's it's Raf Manji, who's also contesting the Islam electorate in Christchurch. Uh, now, because he leads a minor party that's outside parliament, he raised some more interesting, broader ideas aren't, that aren't much debated in routine political coverage. His party's policies are gold card for young people, civics education for greater social cohesion was another one. The universal basic income is an idea they've been um, putting about. Now, of course, these are kind of blue sky ideas and mainstream politics because you know they're the sorts of things that would be very difficult to implement and you have to get into to government and have support for them so it's a little bit theoretical uh, to be discussing it in this way but I just thought it was interesting that having pro- put up some of these new and different ideas this was how the New Sub Nation host Simon Shepard responded. Isn't this a risky policy? 500,000 under 30s voted last election. Mm. Have a total pool of 2.9 million votes. Yeah. Don't you need the older voters if you're going to get across the line, not only with the 5% threshold, but yeah. just in the, in the electorate? Yeah, it's not it's, just it's about risk- voting. It's actually what, what are the policies that we need? So this is. Yeah, but you've got to attract this- the other, uh, apart from the under 30s, you've got to yeah. attract the rest of the electorate. And I thought that was a really interesting response. You know, Raf Manji saying, look, this isn't just about votes. I'm not just talking about saying things to try and get votes here. This is ideas we need to talk about. Uh, It just, I think at times we're getting to the point where the political media in an election year just can't seem to get beyond saying, you know, but no one will vote for that in October. We can't. What's the point in talking about that? And it was a refreshing change with one of the guests on their panel that followed the interview was uh, Mark Jennings, the co-editor of the newsroom. And, uh, you know, he had a completely different take on it. No one seems to be really doing anything for younger people. They can't get into the housing market. Raf's offering them a way in here. We've got, he's right, we've got to do something about rebalancing this housing-driven economy. Mm. So I think he's got some good ideas. Whether they're electorally attractive enough, I take um, Nathan's point. Um, but I'd love to see Islam stand up and be an Epsom and allow us to inject some big, bold, new ideas, um, you know, into this country because National and Labour out of ideas, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, so I thought there was a nice change. And by the way, when Mark Jennings said that, I, I take Nathan's point about electability. That was a reference to his fellow guest, Nathan Guy, former uh, National Party MP, former Cabinet Minister, who was on the panel with him, and he had reacted completely the opposite way. He'd heard Raf Manji's policies, and one that involved a land tax, and said, well, you know, that'll go down like a cup of cold sick in Ireland. You know, no one's <laughs> going to vote for that. So exactly the sort of approach we were talking about before. But of course, Raf Manji is, is, a, is, a, is a party leader. He's a candidate in the election, which would have been the reason why he was on the show, presumably. Yes, yeah, fair enough. That's certainly correct. But just because it's still months away, um, the election, maybe not everything has to be how about how we'll vote. Um, mm. Interestingly, the Q and A show on the same day, in fact, on at the very same time as that News Hub Nation show, is the, the TVNZ one Q and A. They had profiles of the Wellington Central candidates. You know, in, uh, in the Sunday Star Times, Andrea Vance in her weekly column was writing about the battleground seats we must now watch in the election campaign. It's, to my mind, it is too soon for this political wargaming. We can't keep it up. Uh, I think the media can keep it up, but I certainly I don't think uh, the citizens can. But with that in mind, I was also interested on that same uh, One News programme uh, that had the lead off on the national gang policy. Mm. Um, I heard Mike Hosking criticising a report in that in that show, which was Chloe Swarbrick uh, announcing her candidacy for the Greens again. So again, another look forward to the election. This is for Auckland Central. Uh, now, Mike Hosking isn't a fan of the Greens at all. He wants them out of Parliament, <laughs> says so very explicitly. Um, but in this case, he wasn't mad at them. He was mad at the news report for confusing viewers about the nature of MMP. The story I watch 
involves clearly a lack of understanding as to how it works. So it revolves around Chloe Swarbrick, who, quote unquote, officially put her hat in the ring for the Auckland Central seat, a seat, quote, that has a lot riding on it for the Green Party because of the MMP system. Now, the rest of the story doesn't go on to explain why it has a lot riding on it for the Green Party and the MMP system, and perhaps that's because it doesn't. So what was the report he was talking about there? Yeah, that was on TVNZ one year. He couldn't remember, by the way, Mike, Mike Hosking, and he's he's on a bit of a kick at the moment about criticising political coverage and even you know his stable mates at the Herald. He's not afraid of doing that, but he's not impressed with the political press gallery. He says it a lot, but that one was uh, TVNZ one news, um, and yeah, it, it's uh, it's something. In this case, I think he might have been right. So you felt it was misleading and confusing. Yeah, because two elections ago, I'm thinking. I remember Mike Hosking isn't my go-to guy for uh, the um, the foibles of the MMP system because he famously got it completely wrong when he was the host of TVNZ's Seven Sharp show and he said you can't vote for the Māori Party if you're not enrolled in a Māori electorate, uh, not on the Māori roll, uh, which was completely wrong. There was a bit of an outcry about that. TVNZ took all the complaints and said, don't worry, Mike will clarify the next night. But he made it worse when he said, I'm sorry I confused the Māori Party um, by by saying this. He said, I'm, I'm just saying they're an electorate party, they're in parliament because people voted for them in, in the seat Te Araraua Flavel one. But of course, they got a second MP, Marama Fox, because their party support top two percent and the proportionality kicked in, so he was he just made it worse <laughs> trying to clarify it. But in this case, I think he's right when he says that one news had said, you know, Swarbrick will be keen to hold on to the seat so she can pull in more MPs on election day, and that won't really. I mean, unless they get below five percent, that is not a factor at all, and mm. most polls would indicate they won't. So it's not as if, as I say, if Raf Manji won Island for the top party, for example, or that Māori Party circumstance repeated uh, that we talked about a moment ago. That that certainly would affect it. So um, yeah, I think TVNZ did get it wrong on Sunday when they were saying the stakes were higher uh, for Chloe Sporobic, um, uh, you know, other than, you know, just one. I guess the only sense is that if she's high up on the list, they know they could put someone lower down that will get in if she wins that seat. But it doesn't mean they'd bring in more MPs. Now you've discovered a new political column and you were pleased to see that last weekend. <laughs> yeah, having said, you know, it's too much was on the sort of here and now <laughs> yes. on this sort of cas- cascade or carousel of political scandals. Uh, they've launched a new one called Hang On What? is the title. Um, and Anna White uh, from the Parliamentary Press Gallery staff wrote the first one about uh, why isn't the Stuart Nash report a big deal was the headline. Um, so she's pointing to uh, the long delayed and awaited report into Stuart Nash's communications, as his letters and communications with, with uh, donors and, uh, and political associates, uh, finding conflicts of interest, the stuff that led to him having to stand down from his police portfolio, then, then lose his other ones. She said, look, the actual report into this, what happened after he quit, that was kind of the end of the media interest and there was relatively little uh, attention paid to this report. What, did she suggest it should have been a, a bigger deal? Yeah, she says this report by the Cabinet Secretary uh, was focused solely on on the actions of Nash, but the the lobbying of ministers was out of scope and the review didn't have investigative powers, but uh, it had been followed up, there was lots of detail in it, and actually they paired up the article, uh, the the column by Anna White, pointing this out, with an actual companion piece by her colleague Thomas Munch, who wrote, uh, picked out all the details from the report about how he'd been uh, the, the the minister had his mates in his ears, was regularly receiving texts and emails. Even there was a case of um, uh, a guy who was appointed to a, um, a, a kind of quango, a startup advisors council, um, a close friend. And so all sorts of interesting detail there that otherwise, you know, would have been just parked because, you know, we've <laughs> moved on to the next cabinet minister in trouble and all of that. But also you should we should mention Pete McKenzie, the Voyager a winning journalist of the year. He mm. went to the Ombudsman to get the emails released in the first place. He also followed up with a story about what this latest inquiry report had revealed for Newsroom. Mm. So last week on Mid- Midweek Media Watch, uh, Hayden Donnell was uh, telling Anna Thomas about a feature story in the Herald on Sunday, which had been retracted and removed from the Herald website. But it wasn't clear what the problem was. Uh, there have been some developments on that one. 
Yes, uh, the story in question was a pretty prominent one. This is the front page of the Herald on Sunday's review section the weekend before last. So this was all about a woman called Coralie Collins Annan, who was described as a high-flying lawyer in the US, apparently after being raised by parents who she said were drug addicts who'd become entangled uh, with the mongrel mob. So uh, the online correction said... Um, a story published, this, so this, is, this is what they published a week later. A story published last Sunday about a woman who had triumphed over a difficult background to become a lawyer had elements that were false. In publishing the article, we fell short of the high standards and procedures we hold ourselves to. And curiously, that correction was issued by the Herald's publisher, NZME, not in the name of the Herald itself. Uh, and it didn't say exactly what was false in that story. So uh, you're saying it wasn't exactly fully transparent? Yeah, yeah, yes it wasn't. And as Hayden said, when you read the story, there are a few things that ring alarm bells. It was all based on a single interview with her. And dropped in the middle of the story was the fact that um, the the story subject had a book coming out or was mm. planning to get something published. There were also other accounts about her saying that she was um, had told people there might be a Netflix series based on part of her life and all of this. But um, on the other hand, you know, the story was written by an experienced Herald journalism, uh, a, a journalist. Um, but last weekend, it all became clear what was wrong with the story because the Herald's rivals at Stuff uh, had published a very different story one week later, all about um, about Anne. And this was by um, Steve Kilgallen, and it was called The, the Strange Double Lives of Coralie Collins Annan. So what did his version of her story say? <laughs> well, uh, the, not a lot of things he'd said about her career uh, after leaving the country were all that true. So the key difference was that Steve Kilgallen quoted a lot of people who knew her and people at Auckland University where um, she would uh, run was part of a moot debating club. Uh, there were some missing finances from that. There were uh, She hadn't completed a degree. A lot of uh, things she'd said about herself were contradicted. And then Steve put some of these claims to Coralie and in herself who was in a position that she really had to address them. And so you can clearly see in the end that her story, in her own words, uh, parts of it were um, yeah, just, just not true and not accurate, and she eventually had to concede this. Um, so she's not really a high-flying lawyer, it turns out, hasn't worked for some of the companies in the in the US that she said she did or had worked on some of these high-profile cases. So painstaking work by Steve, you know, good journalism to put her in the position where she had to actually own up to it. But there was one really startling bit um, that stood out. This is in Steve Kilgallen's story. It says, Later, Annan asks for questions to be sent to her agent, former National Party candidate Jack Bazant, who didn't respond. And then it says, A screenshot that Annan later sends to the staff journalist later suggests that Bazant had advised her not to comment because he didn't think stuff had enough for a story. Well, if you saw the papers last weekend, they had plenty for a story, and that is pretty poor advice uh, from an agent, I, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just before we go, got a couple of minutes, uh, Colin, a bit of uh, what well, prescience uh, scheduling on TV in this weekend. Yeah, so the very day that Daniel Ellsberg, the leaker of the Pentagon Papers, died, uh, age 92, uh, three uh, screened the movie that was all about that uh, and the Washington Post publication of the Pentagon Papers. Um, that was The Post, came out of, I think, 2018, mm. starring Meryl Streep as Catherine Graham, the publisher, Tom Hanks as Ben Bradley, the editor. And it also had um, uh, Matthew Rhys Evans as Ellsberg himself. It turns out as a Welsh actor, but a very uncanny likeness with the actual... Daniel Ellsberg back in the early 1970s and it turns out there's a bit of a Kiwi connection too in that um, his breakthrough TV role was back in 1998. He appeared in that series Greenstone, that colonial era drama. But anyway, here's a very brief snippet of uh, him as Ellsberg in the movie The Post that screened last weekend. This is the one, one of the Washington Post's editors telling Daniel Ellsberg that what he was doing could come at a real personal cost. Mm. They're going to come after you, you know. And i got to be honest... The breadcrumbs weren't too hard to follow. They're gonna lock you up, Dan. Wouldn't you go to prison to stop this war? Theoretically, sure. And then the main voice there was Bob Odenkirk uh, from Breaking Bad, Bad mm -hmm. and Better Call Saul uh, fame. But the real Ellsberg in, in 1971, I think it is, after the publication of the papers, he was asked in a press conference if he regretted his choices after finding out that he faced a possible jail term of 115 years. Uh, how can you measure the jeopardy that I'm in, uh, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 115 years, or other ludicrous uh, amounts like that? to the penalty that has been paid 
uh, already by 50,000 American families here and hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese families. It would be absolutely presumptuous of me to pity myself in that context, and I certainly don't, and I'd be ashamed of myself. Lucas, that's why they call him the grandfather of whistleblowers. Absolutely. Colin, thanks so much. Uh, look forward to your Sunday morning fair uh, just after nine uh, with Jim Moore. And uh, yeah, have a good few days. Sure thing, and back with you in a fortnight.